Right, the president yes. can waive it for national security reasons, and those national security reasons, I think, are highly attenuated now. The rest of the region, do you think their reaction to this would be nothing? The, the U.S. allies in the region, U.S. opposition in the region, they, they would all think um, nothing of this? This would have no repercussions for the U.S.? They may not like it, but they'll have to accept it for the following reason. Uh, first of all, what are they going to do? Are they going to burn down the American consulate in Benghazi? That already happened. Are they going to kick the, close the American embassy in Damascus? That already happened. The arguments against moving the embassy are dusted off from when, when this was first proposed 20 years ago, not noticing the fundamental change in the region. The Arab world is on fire, and it's not an embassy in Jerusalem that's burning it down now. Uh, America's allies in the region, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, now they're going to be delighted by a Trump administration that's going to take a harder line to their primary enemy, Iran. Israel isn't their primary enemy anymore. And while they may have to pay lip service in terms of objections, uh, it is hard to imagine that any actual action would ensue from this. The Arab world is not the place it was 20 years ago. I'm talking with Eugene Kantorovich. He's a professor of law at Northwestern University. And I wanted to ask a legal question about uh, some of the anti-BDS legislation that's out there. The boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement is up against uh, legislation in this country and in other countries, too. And there's also some talk about uh, defunding the United Nations and uh, legal maneuvers that would defund the fund the United Nations. Where do you think this is going? Uh, a lot of people see BDS legislation and boycotts as being part of our inherent rights to boycott things. Uh, why not um, let these things move forward? Uh, I think it's it's a very dishonest argument that we have some kind of American attachment to boycotts. Uh, or that boycotts are inherently tools of uh, justice rather than injustice. Boycotts are a tool, and whether they're used for justice or injustice depends. Uh, Professor Khalidi mentioned a variety of examples in which boycotts were used for what we see as good causes. Boycotts were also imposed by Nazi Germany on Jewish goods in the 1930s. Boycotts were imposed on the state of Israel by all of its Arab neighbors from 1948. And today, uh, I think uh, Professor Khalidi would say that boycotts uh, of gay and lesbian people would not be supportable, would not be a proper practice. And indeed, many American states also have laws saying companies can't boycott gay and lesbian people, can't deny services or goods or uh, refuse to do business with them. But un unpopular boycotts fail. That's, their, that's the thing. And just boycotts move and change policies. Uh, really, it has nothing to do with it. Then we wouldn't need laws against boycotting gays and lesbians, for example. The question is, the state laws that are being passed in America now, their premise is that boycotting Israel is actually a form of discrimination. To say we will not do business with someone because of their national connection to Israel is a form of racial, ethnic, or national discrimination. And company, states can clearly say we're not going to do business with companies that engage in what we consider discriminatory activities. The fact that Professor Khalidi does not consider it discriminatory, uh, especially given that he word, used words like infest for uh, Jewish officials who are going to come into the government is hardly proof that it is not discriminatory. And uh, legislators are entitled to their own judgment. Do you think that there is support for the kind of position the Trump administration is going to come in with uh, here in the United States? Uh, we heard Professor Khalidi talking about uh, the Jewish community here, they would like to see a two-state solution, most of them. It would seem that these actions would preclude a two-state solution. Uh, there, are, uh, there was a poll from the Brookings Institution, and it said that nearly half of Americans back sanctions over Israeli settlements. Forty-six percent uh, back sanctions uh, and actually want to see action taken against them rather than see them supported. Uh, is there real backing and support for these policies in the U.S.? The vast majority of Americans are strongly supportive of Israel. And what's ironic is – Professor Khalidi really has no leg to stand on because he says the supporters of Israel are living in a little bubble. But now 15 states have passed anti-boycott legislation and maybe a dozen more are expected to pass it this year. Uh, Congress is about to pass such legislation. A president has been elected on an extremely pro-Israel position. So the 
when it comes to people actually voting and uh, the legislators closest to the people, it's clear that Americans have an overwhelming and bipartisan support of Israel. It's true that President Obama spent eight years trying to drive the Democratic Party away from Israel. Uh, now that he is no longer in power, uh, it is unlikely that will continue to be the agenda of the, uh, of the, de- of the Democratic Party. And uh, I think, uh, uh, President, you know, the Americans pay less attention to foreign policy issues and take a lot of cues from signals sent by their leaders. Obama spent eight years delegitimizing Israel, which doubtless affected Democrats' perceptions and opinions of it. Uh, I think uh, now an administration that is going to stop this delegitimization is going to really change opinions also. Is it really delegitimizing Israel when you sign a $38 billion military agreement with them? It's... uh yeah, of course. It, to, to say it, it that Israel to be really supportive. To say that Israel now, it's true. The fact that he did, Obama did not do every horrible thing to Israel he could have done, but to say that Israel has an obligation to keep Jews from living in Jerusalem is extraordinary and applies a standard to Israel that has not been applied to any country. And by the way, I think the military aid. Its importance is vastly overstated because the things that, you know, are very important to Israel and very important to the resolution of the conflict. Eugene Kantorovich is a professor of law at Northwestern University. And thanks for joining us and talking about the Trump administration and what U.S. policy is going to be uh, towards Israelis and Palestinians. Thanks, Eugene.